Sape satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta Hello, I'm Dharma Sartero, here with the 23rd episode of Nibbana, the secret treasure of the Buddhas. And this is going to be the final section, or the final episode in this section. And I'm going to try to wrap things up and summarize what we've been over so far. So hold on to your hats, fasten your seat belts. <laughs> I have some very exciting insights to share with you. So please watch all the way to the end. Now, so far we've been talking about Nibbana as a term and trying to get to the bottom of its meaning by going over the fire simile and other teachings by the Buddha. Now I would like to look at Nibbana as a function in the Buddha's teaching. What role does Nibbana play? How does Nibbana relate to the rest of the Buddha's teaching? And what uh, advantages or insights can it give us into the process of realization? So, without any further ado, I'd like to plunge right into discussing Nibbana and the Four Noble Truths as the principal axiom and the ontological roots of the Buddha's teaching. Now, if you haven't done your homework, if you haven't gone over our previous series, especially Matrix Learning, uh, this is going to be pretty steep learning curve. Um, I'm not apologizing for that. I'm advising you to go back and review our videos on ontology and ontological analysis. Otherwise, what we're going to talk about here isn't going to make much sense to you. But hey, I told you to go back and look at those videos earlier, right? So anyway, here we go. What is Nibbana? What role does it play in the Buddha's teaching? It is the axiom on which the whole teaching is based. So we already talked about how Nibbana as a term means like a fire extinguished. When a fire goes out, it simply vanishes as if it never had been. But why? Because the conditions change the causes that created the fire, the relations that is what a fire is, have broken down. But in the Buddhist teaching, now let's take a step back here, right? Everyone knows this term Nibbana or Nirvana, and they know that it means some ideal state of being beyond ordinary human beingness, uh, that is supposed to give tremendous relief, actually total relief from suffering, and so on like that. Okay. But what is Nibbana in the teaching itself? You know, there are many terms for the state that we call Nibbana. Nibbana is just one of them, and we'll go over the rest of them later on in the video. So what we're really talking about is something that can't be described. An experience, not a word, not a thing, and not even a state, really, but an experience that's beyond all words, beyond all things, beyond becoming and non-becoming, beyond even awareness and non-awareness so beyond everything that there's just really no way to talk about it. Nibbana has become the commonly accepted term. But really what it is, is an experience the Buddha had, and then he wanted to share it with others. And of course, the story of the Buddha's sharing his experience is uh, the story, one of the greatest stories in history. And I'm not going to go into that now. But he was trying to give something that can't even be described. So how is he going to do that? 
Well, what he did was he made Nibbana, or actually the experience that Nibbana refers to, an axiom. And what is an axiom? Well, the regular definition is a statement or proposition that is regarded as accepted, established, or self-evidently true. Of course, the only person that it's self-evidently true for, at least in the beginning, was the Buddha himself. Nobody else had experienced Nibbana, even though it was a well-known term at the time. The question was, what is Nibbana? Is it any of the jhanas? No. Is it any other states dealing with becoming or non-becoming? No. It's beyond both. It's beyond true and false, right and wrong, yes and no, being and non-being. So, what is Nibbana? Well, here's another definition from mathematics. A statement or proposition on which an abstractly defined structure is based. That's getting closer to the truth. Nibbana, or actually the state that we refer to by Nibbana and the other terms, which we'll go over in a little bit, is the proposition of the Buddha's teaching. The proposition of the Buddha's teaching is, you experience this Nibbana and you will find the end of suffering. That's a pretty strong proposition. So <laughs> the Buddha was teaching this and he was using Nibbana as the axiom, the self-evidential truth on which the whole teaching is based. The statement or proposition on which the abstractly defined structure of the teaching is based. And here I want to float a very advanced uh, proposition, very advanced idea to you that there is significance in the structure of the Buddha's teaching. Not just the content. In other words, you have all these suttas in four or five collections. And in those suttas are a bunch of words. And that's the content of the Buddha's teaching. But if you study how that teaching is structured, how those words relate to one another, how they're defined in terms of each other and so on. You will find a structure, an ontological structure. To do that, you have to do an ontological analysis, <laughs> which I have done. So, if you understand what ontological analysis is, you can also do it. And you can also read the significance inherent in the structure of the Buddha's teaching. So, let's go on. Where does this word axiom come from? Maybe that'll give us a clue. Well, the etymology is that it's from the Greek axioma, axioma. What is thought fitting from achios, worthy? In other words, an axiom is something that it's thought fitting or it's given, actually, uh, it's in uh, mathematical pro problems. You'll often say, this is a given. Uh, so it's something that's assumed to be true. Even though it may not have been proved, it's given a set of conditions at the start of a problem or an observation that you can then factor into your analysis. And I looked even deeper because I was trying to find an, an exact definition that describes how the Buddha treats this axiom of Nibbana. So I looked in the thesaurus at the synonyms of axiom, and it's very interesting what they are. Dictum, a truism, a principle, a maxim, an adage, an aphorism, and here's the best one of all, apothem. That's actually how it's pronounced from the Greek apothengestai, to speak out. In other words, an axiom is something spoken by a teacher and then assumed, even though it may not be proven, it's assumed as a basis for further work with the idea that eventually it will be proven. 
But what about this word, apothem? That sounded intriguing, so I looked into it more. The word apothem is very similar to apophysis. Remember our series, Apophatic Antifragility? Well, this goes back to the same ideas. Apophysis is a rhetorical device wherein the speaker or writer brings up a subject by denying that it can be discussed. Accordingly, it can be seen as a rhetorical relative of irony. As a rhetorical device, it can serve various purposes, which are often dependent on the relationship of the speaker to the addressee and the extent of their shared knowledge. Apophysis is rarely literal. Instead, it conveys meaning through implications that may depend on this context. The Buddha is very tricky. He's introducing this term, Nibbana, or any of the other terms that refer to the same thing. And then he's talking around it without mentioning it directly. Well, because it can't be mentioned. Actually, there is no name for this state that we call Nibbana in so many other terms. Nibbana cannot be described. It's ineffable. It's transcendent. It's beyond words and symbols, non-conceptual or paraconceptual or whatever term you want to use. You can't think about it. It's not a subject that will fit in the mind. So how do we deal with it? Well, the Buddha chose to talk around it apophatically. In other words, every single sutta is about Nibbana. The whole Buddha's teaching is about Nibbana. Everything he taught refers to Nibbana and to the emptiness, which is Nibbana's chief characteristic. But when he was around people who had not had the experience new students and guests and people like that. He didn't mention it directly. And you'll see, if you go through the suttas, depending on who the audience is, he may speak directly about Nibbana only to the monks, only to arhats. Or when he's speaking with a guest, with a householder, he rarely mentions Nibbana. But Nibbana is there. Nibbana is the reference point to which all of the Buddha's uh, teachings are related. All of his sermons, all of the suttas, talk about Nibbana indirectly. So it's apophatic. And of course, we noticed this before. I'm going to give you a link here to the Apophatic Antifragility series. You should go back and watch it, because we talk about apophysis quite a bit there. It will help make this clearer. But this is, I know this is difficult. <laughs> it blew my mind so bad. Honestly, I was going to make this uh, video yesterday. <laughs> I just couldn't get it together. So let's go on. Apophysis, as a rhetorical device, depends on the relationship of the speaker to the addressee and the extent of their shared knowledge. Apophysis is rarely literal. Instead, it conveys meaning through implications, depending on the context. Metaphor, simile, just like the Buddha used so many examples, right? If the addressee does not already possess the knowledge, then it may be a way to condescend. In other words, uh, let's say in a political discussion, there are two candidates are debating, and one of them says to the other, and I'm not even going to bring up that felony conviction of yours. <laughs> See, that's condescending apophysis. The speaker suspected at mu as much, but wanted to call attention to the addressee's ignorance. In other words, we could be talking about Nibbana, and I could be saying something like, well, it doesn't even make sense to discuss the Buddha's apophysis. <laughs> And, and then watch the blank look on the listener's face. Yeah. That's one use of apophysis. It can also be a sincere and polite way 
to share necessary information which the addressee may or may not know without implying that the addressee is ignorant. So, in other words, Nibbana, the concept of an ultimate state, was well known in the Buddha's time. It wasn't esoteric like it is today. And so the Buddha, when addressing people, he didn't know the state of their knowledge, or maybe he did, it depends on who you listen to. Anyway, when he was talking with people who didn't know about Nibbana, he wouldn't bring it up directly. He would talk around it. Only when he was talking with his students, his monks, and especially his advanced students, the Arhats, then he would discuss openly Nibbana, the end of suffering, and so on. Well, let's look into this some more. The meaning of this is that the Buddha's teaching is, first of all, apophatic. Nibbana is always the unstated elephant in the room. Nibbana is there, foremost in the Buddha's mind, whether he's talking openly or talking in a disguised way about it, to save the feelings of the listeners. He doesn't want to embarrass the listeners. He doesn't want to alienate his guests by uh, reminding them uh, that they're ignorant. So he simply talks around the issue so that people will begin to get into the flow, into the mood, into the context of the Buddha's teaching, which, remember, is always about Nibbana, because that's what he wanted to share with people. Secondly, the Buddha's teaching is fractal. Every sutta reflects the same design or image. Just like if you look at a fractal, like the Mandelbrot set or something like that, you'll see every part reflects the image of the whole, sometimes in a distorted way or sometimes in a clearer way. But still, there's one pattern, and it's repeated in many, many variations. Similarly, in the Buddha's teaching, there is one pattern, one profound significance, Nibbana. And that significance informs, it fills, and is repeated everywhere in the Buddha's teaching. And that means that the Buddha's teaching is ontologically coherent. The suttas are all based on the Four Noble Truths. Every sutta will fall into one or more categories of the Four Noble Truths. They all point to the same ineffable, inexplicable state, that is, Nibbana. And finally, each one is an extended metaphor about the indefinable. The Buddha is saying, go inside, explore the unknown. There's something very valuable there, which we're going to call Nibbana. But actually, it really has no name, can't be named, can't be described or discussed directly. So we're going to discuss around it by using similes, metaphors, examples, like that. And in that way, hopefully you'll get motivated to do the process, do the explanation, and get the experience yourself. So, to sum up, the Buddha's teaching is apophatic, fractal, and ontologically coherent. And what is the significance of that? No other tradition or system of thought, including modern science, can make this claim. Now, if you're not getting chills up and down your spine, and if your mind is not blown to the four corners of the room, at this point, it means you didn't do your homework. <laughs> you don't understand how incredibly significant this is. For example, in modern science, there is a tremendous division between the knowledge we have of the atomic domain, the quantum domain, and the knowledge we have of the macroscopic domain, uh, ordinary life. There's a tremendous disconnect there, and it has not been bridged. Uh -huh. And the same goes for our knowledge of the cosmos, astronomy, and so on. There's things going on out there that 
we just can't imagine or explain. And we certainly can't connect them with our ordinary everyday life. So this means that science, as it is today, is not ontologically coherent. If you try to go from physics to biology or from biology to psychiatry or something like that, they're not functioning on the same theoretical background. It's not ontologically coherent. But the Buddha's teaching is. The Buddha's teaching from the beginning to the end is about Nibbana. It's about the Four Noble Truths. And in the next section, we'll go over the different names of Nibbana, and then we'll discuss the ontological significance of the Four Noble Truths and the other ontological roots of the Buddha's teaching. So, what are some of the other terms that are used to talk about Nibbana, or the state referred to as Nibbana? <laughs> Remember, all these terms are just pointers. They're directing us towards something that really can't be talked about, can't be discussed, has to be experienced. So, what are some of these terms? A sankatang, the uncompounded. In other words, Nibbana does not decompose into parts. Nibbana is one thing. It's not conditioned. It's not compounded. It can't be dissected. It can't be analyzed. It can't be described or limited in any way. Antam, the end. Nibbana is the end. You can't go any further than Nibbana. Nibbana is it. There is nothing beyond Nibbana. Anasavam, the lack of outflows. When you stop going out through the senses into the world, when you stop accepting sense impressions through the senses, when you detach yourself from what we call awareness and consciousness, that's Nibbana, or that's one of the aspects of Nibbana. Satcham, the truth. In other words, every other truth is relative to Nibbana. Nibbana itself is absolute. It doesn't depend on anything else. And nothing else can really describe it. Param, the beyond. Nibbana is beyond everything. Nibbana is <laughs> beyond even the concept of beyond. Gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhisattva. Nipunam, the accomplishment. Someone who is accomplished, a monk who is called accomplished, means he has attained Nibbana. He knows the Nibbana. He lives in Nibbana. He's an Arhant. He's Nipunam. Saddudasam, difficult to see. I know these topics are very abstruse. They're very, very subtle and difficult. But that's the nature of ultimate truth. It is difficult to see. The Buddha admitted this subject, this Nibbana, this teaching is difficult to see, difficult to understand, difficult to practice. But if you can do it, oh, then you, you get benefits beyond anything else. Ajajaram, the undecaying. The Nibbana that was there, the emptiness that was there in the Buddha's time, is the same Nibbana, the same emptiness that we have today. <laughs> it doesn't decay. It doesn't change. There isn't anything there to change. Dhuvam, the permanent. It's eternal. It's unchanging, absolute. Apalokitam, the indestructible. How can you destroy something that doesn't even exist? Anidasanam, the signless. There is no quality. There is no color, no shape, no descriptors of any kind, no measurement of any kind of Nibbana. It's beyond all of that. Nippapancham, the unworldly. 
Nibbana is beyond the world. Nibbana is beyond senses and mind and even consciousness. It's an unworldly thing. Santam, the appeasement. Santam also means peace. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. <clears throat> so the appeasement is the letting go, fading out, and destruction of all desire, of all craving. And this has been referred to many times in the Buddha's teaching. Amatam, the deathless. It's eternal, it can never die. Panitam, the exalted. That this is the highest thing. It's beyond heaven. It's beyond gods. It's beyond everything that we can imagine or can't imagine. Sivam, the auspicious. Of course, there's a god named Shiva in Hinduism. But here we're talking about that which is auspicious. And auspicious means it brings good fortune to everyone. So even by thinking about or talking about Nibbana in any way, we get tremendous merit. It's auspicious. Khemam, peace, the peace that passeth all understanding. Tanhakayo, the destruction of craving. We talked about that earlier. Acharya, the wonderful, that actually uh, achar means to live, a place to live. So acharya means that uh, like a wonderful place to live. Huh? Abhutam, the unborn. Nibbana is never born. It never comes into the world. It's always beyond the world. Anitika, free from harm. If you taste Nibbana, then nothing can harm you. And also you become harmless to others you become only beneficial to others. Aniti Kadhamam, the teaching of harmlessness. This is related. Then, of course, Nibbana means extinction, like a fire going out. Abhyapajo, freedom from suffering, the end of suffering, the goal of the Buddha's teaching. Virago, destruction of passion. Raga means attachment passion for something. And there's a whole science of raga in Vedic knowledge. But the Buddha's teaching is about viraga, uh, detachment, uh, relinquishment of passion. And suddhi, purity. It's very pure. has no downsides. Mutti, emancipation. In Sanskrit, that's mukti, liberation. Anayalo, freedom from attachment. One who has a Nibbana is not attached to anything at all. Deep. Deepa can mean island, lamp, help, or support. In other words, the Nibbana is like an island where you can be safe from everything. It's Lena, shelter. It's Tana peace, saranam, refuge, and finally parayanam, the beyond. So these are all terms that are found in various suttas, and they were collected in one place by my mentor, Jnanananda. So now I would like to go over the ontological roots of the teaching. We already have gone over Nibbana, which is the axiom, the principal axiom of the teaching. Now let's go over the four noble truths. And what are they? The truth of suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the path to the cessation of suffering. The first noble truth is the truth of suffering. Birth is suffering. Aging is suffering. Death is suffering. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, and despair are suffering. Association with the unbeloved is suffering. Separation from the loved is suffering. 
not getting what is wanted is suffering. So the first thing we have to accept is this noble truth of suffering. There's suffering in life. Yeah, and it's undesirable. So let's look into it. The origin of suffering. The craving that makes for further becoming, accompanied by passion and delight, relishing now here and now there. That is, craving for sensual pleasure, craving for becoming, craving for non-becoming. This is the origin of suffering, our craving, our attachment, our desire, our willingness to say that this is no good, I want that. Here is no good, I want to be there. And non-being is no good, so I want to be. Or now being is no good, so I want not to be. Huh? To be or not to be? <laughs> Which one am I going to crave? Well, the Buddha says, any craving is going to cause suffering. So once we become aware that this craving is the cause of suffering, then what becomes possible? The cessation of suffering by removing the cause. The remainderless fading and cessation, renunciation, relinquishment, release, and letting go of craving. So if we know the cause of suffering, then we can get rid of that cause and stop the suffering. It's really quite simple. And the fourth noble truth is the path to the cessation of suffering. And that, of course, is the noble eightfold path. Right view, right resolve, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort right mindfulness, and right concentration. So I just want to point out again that the first item is right view. If we don't get right view, if we don't have the correct understanding, if we have only a superficial understanding of the Buddha's teaching, then the rest of the items cannot reach fruition, and we will not get the result that we're looking for. So, each of these four noble truths has a specific mode of activity in connection with it. In connection with the first noble truth of suffering, we should comprehend it. We should understand that we're suffering, and suffering is the default condition of life. In connection with the second noble truth, the origin of suffering, we should abandon it. Once we know the cause, we should let it go. Because we can see this is making our suffering. In regard to the third noble truth, the cessation of suffering should be experienced. So the Buddha says that this teaching is to be experienced by the wise. To experience the cessation of suffering means to let go of this craving, this desire, this passion, the attachment that's driving us into all of these uh, states of becoming. So, when this is experienced, then we can understand, oh, yes, this is really the cessation of suffering. And how do we experience that? We have to develop the path, the Noble Eightfold Path. And these eight items, beginning with right view. So, those things should be developed. Now, by the way, all this comes from the Dhamma Chakka Pavartana Sutta, a very important sutta that you all should read. And there's one more ontological root that we'll be going into in depth in this series. Oh yeah, we're just getting going here. <laughs> and that is dependent origination. Now, the wheel is a very common symbol in Buddhism. And... On this wheel, you see from ignorance going down through fabrication and so on to suffering, that is the first and second noble truths, which is also called the flood, suffering and its cause. Then the green bubbles on the right are also a process of becoming, also a process of dependent origination. But this series leads to unbinding, and it's the third and fourth noble truths 
which is also called the raft, which is the uh, cessation of suffering and the path to cessation of suffering. So all these are the ontological roots of the Buddha's teaching. We have to master these. If we can understand these uh, five things, these five roots, the Four Noble Truths and Dependent Origination, then everything in the Buddha's teaching makes sense. Everything comes together and it's understandable. So this is the aim of this series to put everything in the Buddha's teaching in its proper relationship with Nibbana and emptiness and show how it is related to the Four Noble Truths and dependent origination. So, that just about wraps up the first chapter, the first big section of this series on Nibbana. And by the way, there are 33 sections, <laughs> just like there are 33 terms describing Nibbana. And we're going to go into each one of those one at a time. Uh, but my mentor, Nyanananda, thought that the very first one should be this cessation of craving, because that is actually the key to the experience of Nibbana. Sabbe satta bhavantu sukitatta bhavantu sukitatta